My name is Michael Zint. I am the founder of First I Came for the Homeless with Sarah Menifee, the poet who was just here. All right, well, my story is, is pretty typical. My health failed. You know, I've got bad lungs, and it made it so that I was no longer able to, to work. And th this happened like 13 years ago. The system is so broken that homelessness was the only option until the SSI claim that I filed came through. And in my case, because it was a lung issue and because the system is somewhat corrupt, um, I failed to succeed in that first filing. That was um, The filing lasted like eight years before I failed. Um, and at that point, I was furious with the system and I'd given up completely on ever getting anything accomplished. And it, I ended up going to San Francisco when Occupy was just starting out. And I went there uh, just to, you know, to see what was up and and maybe see if there was a way to get into a better situation off the streets, anything like that. And I firmly believe that if you're homeless and exposed to the elements, you have the, the necessity for shelter. Put up a damn tent. And that's where the problem kicked off. I have, I have this issue when people steal my tents. It pisses me off, you know, and I've got a history of reacting badly towards cities that steal my tent, you know. And as far as the movement, it goes, you know, it, this all came about from all those years of abuses. I mean, you, you, you can only take so much abuse when you're on the streets. You either fall off into drugs and alcohol as the escape of the abuse, or you end up fighting back or going crazy. And most of the people out there are gonna lose you know, mental stability. They're gonna fall into the drugs and the alcohol, but the, the few that don't do that, you know, are the, are the, these are the, the ones that are not the hidden homeless either. These are the ones that are on the street. Those that are on the street, that are not on drugs and alcohol end up becoming determined to not allow this. But because of the visibility issues, you know, of the drugs and the alcohol, you know, it makes it very difficult to, to show what the actual homeless issues are. You know, the, the press wants to paint it with a broad stroke and they use the visible problems of the homeless community in their advertising of the homeless community. And that's why we're at this position, you know. So, <laughs> All these things were happening over those years. I was realizing all this stuff, you know, and I'm coming from this as a, as a former business owner. Um, the high point of my career was I became MTV's fish vendor, which lasted exactly one show because of homelessness, okay? So you make it to the top of your field and then the shit hits and boom, all of a sudden, you know, you're done. I was, you know, the, the contract is signed for $300 an hour with MTV. And that type of exposure to what I do I mean, that was success right there. That was almost guaranteed success in Hollywood. And boom, a disability just destroys that all. So those people who think they're secure, you better wake up. You're not secure, you know? Anything can go wrong at your life at any point in time and totally change your position in life and put you on the streets. And if that happens, there is nothing but abuse and torture there for you. It's designed this way purposefully so that the working class that are just one step above homelessness work the two and three jobs to still struggle and they are not going to stop doing that because the alternative is homelessness. We can't get an accurate count on how many homeless die each year of exposure. I spent, you know, we lost seven here in Berkeley. In Berkeley with nice weather, we lost seven last year during this protest. You know, it started after the death of a person and on through the protest, several people died. And after the protest finally settled here, one of the most famous homeless men in the country died, which is Hate Man in Berkeley over at People's Park. So, I mean, this was just this seven dead homeless people in one cold season. And that needs to be seriously thought about. And then when I looked at the numbers, those that I could find, there is no way to estimate so I had to sit here and do some math on number of cities and all this. Between 40 and 45,000 people are going to die this year, okay? That's genocide, right? There's no reason for these people to die. The only reason they're dying is because the government says, you're not allowed to take care of yourself. You have to let us take care of yourself. If you don't let us take care of yourself, we're going to send our thugs with their badges, sticks, and guns to make you. And that's where we're at now, and that's why this fight is so friggin' important. If we don't win our personal rights right now, in 20 years, what do you think is going to be there? And everybody out here is getting older, okay? The first people that are on the list of vulnerabilities, seniors, disabled, mentally disabled, addicted, 
But listen, it's seniors and disabled, okay? People need to wake up and realize those groups, you know, those groups are going to include them at some point. You know, unless they get hit by a car tonight, they're going to end up getting old. You know? It is the right to take care of yourself. If you, if you end up homeless, the system cannot deal with you. We already know that. So you're expected to die in the streets because you're not allowed to shelter yourself. Okay? We're fighting for the right to shelter yourself, to put up that tent in the commons, the land that we all own. We own this, even though Bart comes up and says, oh, this is private property. I'm sorry, quit bullshitting. This is public property, it's the commons. We all own it equally. But the truth goes, it's public if you're rich enough. You know, a house person in an earthquake will be able to set up his tent out here if his house gets crushed. A homeless person without that house to start with does not have that ability, and that's a problem. This is all part of the movement, okay? And it's, it's actually the movement started um, out of the ashes of Occupy SF. Uh, the group that is here that did all this is a handful of homeless that were, that were in the original tent city of Occupy. That got raided. Everybody scattered. The movement got, you know, got basically destroyed. And then a handful of homeless came back. We took the 101 Market Street, Federal Reserve. We call it the 101. We take the Federal Reserve February 28th of 2012 after Occupy is out of the news. And we hold the Federal Reserve for the next nine months. And we put you know, we're talking 12 people started it and we went to war with SFPD and we kept coming back every time we got arrested, we videoed everything. And the uh, protest that was there grew to about 100 people and became very unmanageable. We did not have any rules, it was total chaos. And all those mistakes that we made are how we developed this. And then, you know, that disappeared. We chalked, the core group of, of the 101ers chalked the Federal Reserve for the next year. And then me and Sarah Menifee, my co-founder, um, we developed, first they came for the homeless, with this small group of people. Now, this small group of people, people need to understand this, okay? There were, I think, 13 of us, and I actually have to look, okay? Of those 13 that started this with us, six of them have now died, okay? In the last four years, six of the people that were first, they came for the homeless, that helped us develop this, are dead. And, you know, I'm next. I'm, you know, there might be another one who beats me, but this cost me my health. What little bit I had left, it's gone. Yeah, you know, that's the truth about exposure and life on the streets. You know, it's harsh. And these people that died, yeah, these people that died, it was mostly because of drugs or alcohol related issues. OK, but that doesn't mean that they're less human. These people helped me get here. The reason we're drug and alcohol free is because, first off, this is a protest. Second, it's an intentional community that can be sold to the public because it performs a service and it's it's set up to be as safe as possible and to you know to, to go and and promote empowerment um, awareness self-awareness um, build confidence the things that have happened in this camp over the last few months i have backed off and let the camp develop on its own i was not interfering in anything this camp filed that temporary restraining order on its own without my advice they did it without legal help they responded to a threat this is how the homeless community is for real. If they can come together and work together, this is what happens. You know, these are American people that have all the rights as everybody else, have all the abilities of everybody else. And, you know, it, it's just the people that live inside just can't see these things. They're not allowed to see these things because the press won't let them. Okay, I'll have to give you a little bit of history. Right. The, um, the situation here in Berkeley has been, um, you know, after the portrait, after the 17, I think it was 17 raids, which were very expensive to conduct, and these were obviously not effective in getting rid of us, um, there was like this uneasy truce between us and the city on this piece of property. They left us alone, and we didn't continue protesting. We turned into a passive protest at that to actually start doing what this thing was designed to do and help the homeless. So the city has, has um, visibly supported what we're doing. And as times develop, more and more of the city council members who are against sanctioning us have actually started to speak in favor of what we're doing. So 
We go to find out, because we don't have all the city council members, that six weeks ago, the city government members whom we were not going to discuss, and the city manager has been against us from the beginning. That's where this one of the things that was filed in this uh, class action lawsuit should pull out. Um, but the city manager has been against us. The mayor, I don't know if he's against us or for us. I really don't trust him because he's kind of done some shady things. Um, but I know a couple of city council members who have actively been against us. And those city council members have been working behind the scenes with BART to get rid of us. Now, that was six weeks ago when that, start, when that started. Three weeks ago, there was a fatality in the other encampment that had set up, which does not have rules. Okay. Now, this fatality allowed, conveniently, um, a whole bunch of negative public opinion about us to develop and be used to, you know, oh, to do whatever to get that, you know, that raid done to us, too. They managed to link the two camps together, even though there's railroad tracks and, you know, several hundred feet between us. They still managed to link it together. They brought BART into this, and BART did not know who we were, I'm pretty sure. They just thought we were a homeless camp. No. This is a well-organized protest with a history of being effective. We've done things that no other homeless group has ever done. We, you know, we helped with the boycott of Staples. We helped save the Berkeley Post Office. You know, we're, we weren't key in that, but we were part of it. We helped save it. We occupied it for 17 months. We took City Hall and started changing the narrative and, and started communicating the differences. At that point, we got a lot of attention. And that attention, um, you know, we we're still at the post office, that attention kind of disappeared for a little bit. But then we got some more attention when they raided us at the post office. And then I had to go away for four months to get my health back. Then we come back, and that's when the city council, or the city, a couple of city commissioners step up and say, Mike, you got to do this protest. And I was down for it. So that's, that's how it rolls to this point. And now we've got all of that going, and Bart does not know this. Okay. Oh, by the way, to give us some more popularity, we're also the group that helps save the library books here. We occupied the back of the library, and one of our members confronted the head librarian and caused him to resign that day. Okay, That's what this group has done. Now, these are a lot of behind-the-scenes things that really nobody knows about. But enough people know about it that when Bart stepped in to come after us, all those people rallied to our support. And this, again, is a coalition that's been developing since we got here three years ago. On our coalition are some very, very influential people. And, you know, it, we're a homeless, it, a homeless led movement, okay? But that does not mean that those other people out there don't have influence on how we do things. But we need to keep the image of being homeless led. That's the key. This is not Aussies. Excuse me, Aussies is housed people. That's homeless speak. The Aussies don't understand homelessness. They want to do the right thing for homeless people and help them. They don't know how, though, because they don't understand. So what they're actually doing is a lot of times they're getting in the way, but a homeless-led movement has input to the local community. And if this whole thing works properly, we can influence and design it ourselves. We can influence and design something that our experience says will work. We know how to get off the streets. We know why we're not able to get off the streets. So we're fighting to put in place a structure that will allow all those people to get off the streets. How do we get off the streets and why are you getting off the streets? Okay, getting off the streets first off requires affordable housing to be built, which isn't going to happen because it's a commodity. And people understand, need to understand what this does to homelessness. When housing is a commodity, it's, a, it's an investment, okay? There needs to be future growth. There needs to be profit. Affordable housing coming in to a neighborhood could have a negative impact on their commodity investment. So the entire community is against it, naturally built into the system. It is built in to keep poor people from ever getting off the streets. And they're not gonna ever put up affordable housing. Let's quit playing games. How many years have they been promising it? They're not gonna do it. You're gonna have to get in the streets and you're gonna have to fight. And you're gonna have to go to these politicians' houses. You're gonna have to target them where they live. You're going to have to up the pressure, just like we've done. You know, ask Scott Wiener how he likes us. He's a senator now. We had three Wiener roasts in his front yard in protest of them. First they came for the homelessness. You know, we had a few actions in San Francisco because that's where we came from. But our style is direct targeted attacks for effect. And we don't target issues necessarily. We target people. We target the people who can make these decisions because if they're not going to make the right decision, I'm going to go give them shit. 
and I'm gonna bring a bunch of my friends with me when I give them shit, and I'm gonna do it with style, and I'm gonna do it with humor, and I'm gonna do it without violence or vandalism, because those two things, that's not about protesting, okay? We wanna create positive energy out here, and any, any negative action actually taints what we're doing, and that can't be allowed to happen, you know? And that's why we've gotten this far, because we force that. Oh yeah, we've created a, a, such a positive energy bubble when we were at the 101 that for two years you could go back and actually feel the energy. If you were a participant, you would go home. You would feel at home there, even after all the bullshit we had to do with the cops. And most of those videos have never been released. There was a lot of illegal activity by SFPD against us. A lot of people got injured. You know, we got it all videoed, but we never, we never had the opportunity to do anything with it because at that point, we were just a group of rowdy homeless who were one step above a gang. Well, they, they call it an intentional community. It's intentionally designed to perform a particular function and accomplish a particular thing for those people who are, who are involved in it. Are you opposed to homeless shelters? Yes. Why? Because it's warehousing of humans. It's also... Yeah, I'm opposed to the, the current shelter system. I'll put it like that. I'm not opposed to shelters. I'm opposed to the current shelter system, the way it's set up, because it's the warehousing of humans. It's usually run like a dictatorship. Um, it, there, there's always the possibility of discrimination and cliques developing between the employees and the homeless that come in. We've had that problem many times here in Berkeley. Um, you know, and, and the, discrimination is, the discrimination goes this way, okay? There's color discrimination. Doesn't matter what color you are, you always get discriminated against, depending on who's in charge. There's also uh, LGBT uh, discrimination at a very, very high level that really doesn't get talked about. And those people don't need to be involved in that, okay? Most of the occupations I've conducted have always had LGBT representation. Now, I'm straight. I cannot speak for the LGBT issues. I expect LGBT community members to come up and speak on these issues that are involved in this. And I did have one for the entire time at the post office, Lilith is transgender, and she was there she was actually holding down the post office for years, but she participated for the entire 17 months that we were there, and she brought to light a lot of the issues in Berkeley here in the LGBT community that I was unaware of. And that was critical, you know? And she also educated me and grew me as somebody who was confused on the LGBT issues. There was confusion as to the pronoun. And, you know, I, I sat there and I had difficulty with the pronoun for a couple of months, okay? But it, it caused that change in me where I consciously made the effort now of getting the pronoun right. And that's kind of important because as it sits right now in our society, people don't care about the pronoun. And Lilith taught me through how she felt and how upset she got. She got upset when we used the wrong pronoun. Um, she taught me that her feelings in this were more important than my not concentrating on getting that pronoun right. So that's what we did. And through that transformation, my self-transformation, we've now incorporated that as well in First They Came for the Homeless. Now, First They Came for the Homeless is an evolution. We're all human, we all make mistakes. So we're trying to develop a human community. And it's not gonna be perfect, but we're gonna try to pick at each one of these issues as they develop. Now, we've handled racism. I'll tell you right now, you wanna know how we, know we handle racism here? Um, I'm not a color, I'm a person. Please don't use color in description of me, please, okay? If there's a person who is black here, Please don't say the black guy, because that automatically separates us. All right, I don't want that separation. That is a guy, okay? He's a guy. Bring him into the conversation as a guy, not as a color. All right, that's, that's key. A sex, it doesn't matter how you identify yourself. It doesn't matter what you look like, what you want to have sex with. You're a person. Identify them as a person. Don't use the description of who or how they are, because that's the one thing that the system needs to separate out a group of people and start persecuting them. I have another question for you. You said that a homeless-led movement can solve the homelessness. Yes, only... I want you to tell me what exactly it is that you envision. Okay, what, the, the reason a homeless-led movement is so important is, as I stated, the house who are trying to help the homeless don't get it. They try things without consulting the homeless. Now, the homeless are homeless. We know what it's like. The house don't know. So we know what we need to do to get there. The house are putting these things in place, though, that literally prevent us because of that lack of understanding. Now, a homeless-led movement 
can bring the true issues to light from the home's perspective, not the house perspective. And if we can get the house to work with us, we can start solving the problem. Okay, tell me that perspective now. The, well, I can't speak on what the house perspective is. One of, one of the things that I'm oh, noticing well, though, the well, the homeless perspective, how do you want to fix this? well, how I want to fix it, first off, is let us have tents, okay? Let us have tents, let us take care of ourselves. That in itself is going to reduce drug population, that's going to reduce the mental disabilities, and that's also going to allow those people the, the time and the stability to work their own way off the streets without using the system, okay? The system is overloaded, and the system is forcing you into the system which is already overloaded. So let's, take, let's ease the burden on the system and allow people to, to, to grab up some of that burden on their own. They'll deal with their own life, they'll get off the streets. Now, you set up a model that's attractive, that people want to be a part of because they see that it works, okay? Now, we're drug and alcohol free for several reasons. One of those reasons, though, that's kind of important is in this community, I've got addicts. I've got recovering addicts. They don't want that around them because it makes their struggle even harder. That's key. And I also want to set up an environment where somebody who is addicted says, I'm sick of my life the way it is. I like the way they're living better, and I'm going to clean up and go. Does it work? Yeah. Within two weeks of this place being here, I had somebody from the Gilman Street encampment and his mother come here clean and sober. They spent the next three months here. They got jobs. The SSI came in. They got their money together, and they moved out of here into housing. Okay, That's because we are attractive when they're ready. And this needs to be here for those people when they are ready. I can't protect them, though, because their actions and the way they're living their lives are part of the reason that homeless people all over the country can't take care of themselves.